Good afternoon. I'm Sophia McLennan. I'm the director of the Center for Global Studies, and I'm also a professor in the School of International Affairs and in comparative literature. And I just want to uh, welcome all of you uh, today to the opening keynote for our symposium, Afghanistan in Global Perspective. The concept for this series of events was really organized around the idea that Afghanistan both defines and defies many of the global dynamics that we've been observing, not just since the uh, events of 9-11-2001, but really um, throughout human history. There's something very special about Afghanistan, both in the way in which it fits in and in the ways in which it doesn't fit in with many of the paradigms that people use to explain global intersections. Um, our concept here was to bring together uh, policymakers, intellectuals, writers, academics. Uh, we screened a film on Wednesday to really offer a range of interdisciplinary perspectives, different angles on, uh, on just a whole series of um, topics from economics to religion to history, uh, to war um, and human rights. So we hope that you'll join us tomorrow when we have a, another series of really impressive talks, um, starting with uh, former NPR correspondent Sarah Chayes. And then our final event is the closing keynote by Afghan American writer Tamim Ansari. Everyone here is welcome to join us. To wel you're welcome to join us for lunch. Uh, we're, you know, very, very much uh, wanting to make this a very comfortable and and uh, productive conversation. I want to take a moment and thank the extraordinary team that worked hard to put all this together. Uh, it was a ton of work. Um, special thanks to Olivia Gerhardt and Caitlin Lovejoy, who aren't even in the room to hear me say this because they're so busy making sure that we have the food and all the other things that'll be out there waiting for you when we're done. Um, also, uh, thanks to the CGS staff, Nathan Markowski, um, and our team of interns, Emily Danzik, Maddie DiRocco, Mia Petruniak, and Morgan Erlob. Again, almost none of them are in the room to hear this. Um, I also want to thank my symposium co-organizers, Lior Sternfield and Wally Amadi, uh, who really helped conceptualize this event and created the sort of network of, um, of people that we reached out to to participate. Um, I want to also uh, let everyone know that after this, we have a reception here in the atrium. Please stay with us. We will have some things to eat, you know, some stuff to drink. Uh, we will have books available um, and, uh, you know, we encourage you. These are books written by people participating in the symposium. Uh, and uh, we also have, I think, uh, 10,000 Villages has some other uh, sort of fun things that you might want to look at. Um, all right, so now uh, it's my great honor to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Ambassador Roya Romani. Ambassador Romani is a senior advisor at the Atlantic Council South Asia Center. She also serves as a, as a distinguished fellow at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security, as well as a senior fellow for international security at the New America Foundation. She's a former Afghan diplomat with nearly two decades of experience working with governments, NGOs and multilateral institutions. Ambassador Romani was the first woman to serve as Afghan ambassador to the United States, the first Afghan woman ambassador to Indonesia, and served as the first director general for regional cooperation at the Afghan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In 2007, she received the best human rights activist award by the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. In 2017, she was named the People's Ambassador, and in 2019, she was featured in Time Magazine's 100 Next list as a, quote, fierce advocate of peace on Afghan terms, end quote. 
She holds a bachelor's degree in software engineering from McGillan University and a master's degree in public administration and international law from Columbia University. Ambassador Romani was born in Kabul in 1978 after the Soviets, after the Soviets entered Afghanistan in 1989, the country entered into a civil war and Romani school was often closed due to missile strikes. In 93, her family led, fled to pa Pakistan and she studied in a Saudi funded school. Reflecting on that time, she said, quote, as an Afghan woman, very early on, like the rest of my cohort, we learned that you have to try to make the best out of what you have. So uncertainty was what dominated most of our lives, end quote. She returned to Kabul in 98, but refused to leave the house because she did not want to wear the Taliban required burqa. The next year, she traveled to Canada to study. And in 2004, when she returned to Afghanistan, she worked for several Canadian nonprofits focusing on human rights, women's empowerment, and education. After becoming ambassador to the United States, she continued to advocate for women's rights, especially women's role in the peace process. She's consistently said that any peace deal that ignores half of the population will not work. She's also argued that the essential role of women in the peace process makes women's rights not just an ethical issue, but a matter of national security. After the Taliban's return to power in August 2021, uh, 2021, and the worsening of women's rights in, in her country, Ambassador Romani has been especially vocal about the crisis, suggesting that the conditions are so dire that when women protest on the streets today, they are basically committing suicide. She's a passionate believer in the importance of fostering innovation for progress and has worked tirelessly promoting equality and inclusivity for sustainable peace. Please join me in offering her a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Professor McLennan, uh, for the kind introduction. Dear students, distinguished professors, academics, and esteemed guests, good evening to all of you. Assalamu alaikum, may peace be upon you. It's my real pleasure to be here this evening with you while I am trying to get this screen going. Just two years ago, Afghanistan celebrated over $1 billion in exports, roughly 15 times more than what it was in the year 2000. Life expectancy had increased by 22 years. Today, more than 24 million Afghans, which is over half of the population, need humanitarian aid to survive. The majority of Afghan families face food insecurity. It's estimated that around 97% of Afghans live below the poverty line. This is after we have poured 20 years worth of energy, of blood, and of treasure into the country. 20 years is a long time, long enough that many of us now view the crisis in Afghanistan as a tired topic. Despite pronounced Afghanistan fatigue, your presence here indicates your sustained interest in lives of so many millions of Afghan that are suffering and are forgotten. This symposium and others like it, represents a great opportunity for us to reinvigorate ourselves and think critically about the way forward. I also want to thank 
specifically Dr. McLennan, Dr. Ahmadi, and Dr. Sternfield for inviting me here. It's a real priv privilege. And I am looking forward to joining you as we discuss perspectives on Afghanistan and the way forward. Currently, international community is asking how they should react to the humanitarian needs of country. There are two major ideas. The first says that we should cut all forms of aid and humanitarian support completely. To continue to supply aid would be to finance the Taliban's regime. It would indicate international tolerance for human rights violation happening in the country and provide fiscal backing for them, the Taliban, to continue to spread their ideology. The second approach says that humanitarian aid must continue. These, uh, those who support this path rightly note that the ones who would suffer the most from cutting the aid and the funding would be those who are already victimized by the Taliban's rule, women and children. This is what the question has come to after 20 years of efforts. But before we could even begin to answer it, we must understand what led us to this moment. When you look at Afghanistan a few years ago, of the potential there, it can be incredibly challenging to understand how things fell apart so quickly. How could this have happened? And how did it happen so fast? A question that I am always and almost regularly asked. But I must tell you, there was nothing fast about it. The progress in Afghanistan was always fragile. And it was made even more so by several years of haphazard policies and practices, by a steady decline of international communities' patience, and by corruption and weak leadership on part of the Afghan government. Afghanistan was seen by the international community as a security concern first, and a catch hall for humanitarian aid second. For many, nation, for many, nation building was just happening to be a side effect of these approaches. From 2001 to 2010, Afghanistan was primarily the site of a military operations. Our international partners worked to develop Afghanistan's infrastructure and economy in so far as that infrastructure and economy could help support the war efforts. So when the international community began withdrawal, many of the projects that had been propping up the country for a decade, for, for decades, ceased to exist. And the system left behind began to erode. We must remember, the Afghanistan of 2000s was completely isolated. The country was made completely ignorant of things that the rest of the world were taking for granted. There were less than 2,000 analog digital phone lines. Women were kept completely out of schools for over a decade. U.S. intervention changed things virtually overnight. The population was introduced to smartphones and other technological developments. Women, women were expected to play catch up cramming gears of education in as short of a time as possible. Afghanistan went from having no international presence to expecting uh, officials to juggle complex relationship with other countries, aid organizations, and mounting military forces. Throughout this decade, international community poured money and resources into Afghanistan when the country had little capacity for absorption. This constant influx, influx propped up institutions and created an illusion 
of functionality. But our international partners become less invested year by year. And Afghans recognized the beginning of the deterioration of this new system. Economic inequality exponentially increased. And Afghans turned, turned towards corrupt practices in an effort to provide some semblance of stability for themselves and their families. This affected everything. All of the essential freedoms that Afghans were promised fell by wayside. Freedom of press, the right to representative government, the separation of powers. All of these mechanisms began to cease under the pressure. Every Afghan looked for a way to secure their foothold. And many of the countries most powerful were very successful in doing so. Often at the expenses of others and at the expenses of those achieved freedoms and progress. The institutions that were meant to protect Afghanistan's integrity became entangled with one another, leaving Afghan people the only ones not benefiting from the deal. Increasingly, Afghanistan's executive branch overstretched its power, creeping into the work of the legislature, the court, and many sectors that were intended to operate independent of the government. At the start, the international community's response was to throw money at the problem. A lot of money. Those in power became swollen with funds, and they were very concerned with keeping things that way. This only perpetuated the corruption that had infected the country. As the years passed, the international community tightened their budgets and set forth conditions that were meant to address some of these issues. But these measures were often overlooked or fulfilled only to the bare minimum. In the absence of a functioning economy and bureaucracy, the ultimate source of wealth, identity, and power was through politics. Under both President Karzai and President Ghani, the government set out to create positions and offices that could help Afghanistan along the route to progress. But the first question was always, who gets to do what? Who gets to control the money that had uh, so suddenly flooded the economy? Who gets the power? This question took the system hostage. It was always about power and rarely about the responsibilities inherent to those positions. Who can best support me in my political agenda, not who can best serve Afghan people in this capacity, was the real motive. In addition, Afghanistan was plagued by factionism and warlordism. Division along ethnic and regional lines began to deepen. Afghans fought each other for, be for a better seat at the table. In spite of this, Afghans believed in the changes intervention promised. Afghans voted, believing in free and fair elections. Afghans voted time and time again, even when doing so meant that they would be endangering themselves. After voting, Afghans would have their index fingers dipped in staining ink. This process would prevent a person from voting twice. But in some areas, it also served as refutable proof that someone was engaging in a new system of government. And so the Taliban would drown these individuals cutting off their index fingers as a punishment for exercising their rights. The next election, 
those same Afghans voted again. Only this time, they dipped their middle finger in this ink. This is how much Afghans believed in progress. And there was certainly progress. The Afghan people and their international partners achieved so much. By 2021, Afghanistan's GDP quadrupled. And there was a, an 800% increase in child enrollment in schools since the start of the intervention. However, this progress was accomplished with the backdrop of an unstable government and unsustainable economy, and in the shadow of distrust and suspicion among Afghans. By 2018, the international community wanted an out. Domestic support for Afghan war had waned to almost nothing. And so the Doha talks formed, progressed, and ended. The world was told that the purpose of these talks was to bring peace. But each party involved had a very different definition of that peace. The international community was out of patience, preferring to search for peace through a, a, the creation of a new government, any government that would open the door for them to leave. Many of our international partners had already disengaged from the outcome, nauseated by how the Afghan politicians were still blindly fighting over power. The United States in particular looked for peace in the full withdrawal of their troops. The Afghan government sought peace through the consolidation of their power. The Taliban saw peace as taking over the country and implementation of their ideology whole scale. In effect, these talks negotiated the transfer of the country to the Taliban. Many saw the writing on the wall. The international community began to brace for it, hoping the transition would be less messy than it actually turned out to be. Afghan politician started to move their families and investments out of country. And the Taliban eagerly awaited the moment that they would make their next move. The only people who did not know were ordinary citizens. And even if they had known, there was nothing they could do. All interventions in Afghanistan from the results of the Doha talks of 2021 to the US intervention in 2001, to the Soviet invasion in 1970s and the Mujahideen's movement fighting it, all claimed to bring about peace and freedom. Did they? Well, I suppose that that depends on whose definition you use. But surely, while the war ended for the international community by the full takeover of the Taliban, it did not bring peace to Afghan people. Years of progress have been lost. People are suffering and women are imprisoned. No matter what definition we use, the majority of Afghanistan's population has not known peace in their lifetime in fact, no Afghan around or under the age of 50 has ever known a peaceful day. Peace and freedom in Afghanistan will require some of the following essential elements. Freedom from violence, access to education and opportunity for all men and women, girls and boys alike, and equal treatment under the law. This is the peace that Afghan people have wanted, and it will invariably lead to progress. In order to achieve this, the interests of the region, the goal of the international community, 
and the efforts of the people of Afghanistan must be aligned. Achieving peace and freedom will require the strategic coordination of all three. First, I would like to discuss the region. Afghanistan sits on the border between Middle East, Central Asia, and South Asia. And despite having possible citizenship in three regions, it's not integrated into any. Afghanistan has had an imbalanced economic relationship with its neighbors, where Afghans import nearly everything, but does not export much at all. This is part of the reason why Afghanistan's economy is not sustainable. And it will not become, and it will not become so until the country can build deeper, more reciprocal relationship with the region, with the region and its neighbors. Convincing the region to be invested in peace and freedom in Afghanistan will require them to completely shift their understanding of the regional dynamics. As of yet, the region has not recognized the benefits of a stable Afghanistan versus the ongoing chaos. But because integration is so key to Afghanistan's stability, it's imperative that regional cooperation through joint security efforts, economic projects, water treaties, or electricity sharing agreements are promoted. Next. We must look at how international community should shape their future relationship with Afghanistan. In no way should the international community endorse the action of the Taliban. But we will not, e we will not be able to accomplish anything by ignoring their activities. In fact, turning away from the situation will leave us in exactly the same place we were in 1996. Afghanistan will once again become a breeding ground for terrorists, sustained by systematic hatred towards women and the West. The last two years have also taught us that the leverage that the international community thought that they had on the Taliban has failed to incur a response. The Taliban does not recognize the benefit of compromising with the West as being worthwhile. From the outset, the international community has misjudged, misjudged Taliban's priorities. At the highest level of leadership, members of this organization hold ideology above all else, above economic uncertainty, above recognition and legitimacy, and far, far above the well-being of the Afghan people. Because for the Taliban, peace means uncontested rule. It means forcing that, that ideology on every man, woman, and child. And the Taliban sees the potential to receive the same benefits the international community has withheld by partnering with those who do not require them to make the same compromises. All of these indicate that the international community requires a radical shift in strategy. This change will require outside of the box thinking and a holistic approach to the crisis. Thus far, the UN has proposed a $4 billion relief campaign in their own words, the largest ever appeal for a single country for humanitarian assistance. Four billion dollars will provide essential humanitarian relief to the Afghan people. Alone, this will not lead to long-term peace, but it will be a short-term lifeline. In addition, to this necessary aid, the international community's effort can be served by incentivizing progress. 
In particular, the West may be able to motivate members of the region to deepen their economic relationship with Afghanistan. Further, the international community should be encouraging education exchange and technology for Afghanistan's youth, allowing Afghanistan to become a closed society would ensure that the country's future would become steeped in the harmful ideology of Taliban. The normalization of these beliefs are some of the biggest threats to sustainable peace. So encouraging consistent access to alternatives is crucial for disrupting the cycle of indoctrination. In doing so, the international community will also be empowering the third part of the equation, the Afghan people. Afghans need access and opportunities. They need access to education and technology. They need economic opportunities that will provide individual stability. Afghan women must be at the center of these efforts. No one has suffered more than Afghan women in this crisis. 50% of the schools were girls. Now, now they are banned from getting an education beyond sixth grade. Women are not allowed to practice to, or, or to uh, participate in politics, not allowed to work, not allowed to move freely, not to even dress in the color of their choice. Two years ago, women represented 27% of the civil servants and 40% of the teachers. 77% of women-led civil society organizations have been shut down while those still functioning are facing significant threats and operational and financial risks. The setback in women's rights will have a huge impact in the long run. For Afghanistan, overall economic loss with women out of workforce is valued at around $1 billion. For the world, it represents the loss of 14 million hopes and dreams and the loss of generations of women's potential either completely restricted or extinguished in its dawning. Women must be foregrounded in any conversation, in any plan for Afghanistan's future. Afghan women are the linchpin of Afghanistan's future and can become the source of its success. Peace in Afghanistan depends on incentivizing the regional integration, on empowering and educating women and children on creating economic opportunities for Afghan citizens and on safeguarding Afghanistan's resources. These will create space for internal resistance and prevent Talibanization. These are not easy tasks. They will not be achieved quickly. But more important than ease, more important than quickness, is choosing the right strategies which will support and empower Afghan people, stabilize the region, and be aligned with values and long-term goals of international community. The right strategies and actions will put food on the plates of 12.9 million starving children. It will see 14.2 million women and girls in jobs and in schools. And more than that, it will bring sustainable peace to Afghanistan. This path will ensure that the Taliban's ideology will not fester and boil over. As we search for peace and freedom in Afghanistan, it's important to remember that less can be more when we are able to apply targeted, coordinated intervention in a place that is hungry for opportunity. We must learn from our past and try new approaches. One, 
that is guided by clear and strategic understanding of peace and freedom that we are trying to achieve. That makes sense for the Afghan people. And while I know that these past 20 plus years have been very draining, your attention and your diligence proves that there are still people out there who are dedicated to seeing a prosperous Afghanistan and who are able to hold on to that hope. So thank you for being here. And I'm looking forward to joining you for this excellent event that is planned throughout this weekend. I thank you. Okay, the question, sure. Thank you, Roya. Uh, you identified that uh, everyone was responsible for the mess up in Afghanistan, including the democratic regime as well. So I just want to being on a position of uh, uh, on, in US as an ambassador position, you will be in a position to shed light on the, to identify the cause that why was it impossible to include the democratic regime in peace talk? Should I... It was it was the least possible bargaining cheap to uh, include the democratic regime in the peace talk. Why was it impossible? Mm -hmm. The question is that why uh, Afghanistan's government was not included in peace talks. Uh, I am assuming and understanding that by peace talk, uh, the questioner me uh, is meaning the Doha talks. Uh, why it was impossible? I don't think it was impossible. It was not impossible at all. Uh, the Taliban, of course, uh, were insisting that they wanted to talk to the US. Uh, at the very outset, they were just asking for one meeting with the US. But then, because the US had already decided to find a way out, they started those discussion and it continued. Afghanistan government was completely left out of the discussion as it started. The, this, by design, it was like that. It was so it was not impossible to include them. At the beginning, it was I, I am repeating what what was presented was that it was stated that the uh, American representatives are talking to the Taliban to get to a point to bring the government also incorporated and on board. However, that never really truly materialized. So incorporation was not impossible. It was not by design there. By the time that there was the opportunity for the for the uh, former government to send a delegation, things were already decided. The, everything had progressed a lot. And by the time the, the delegation was there, uh, first of all, the talks uh, by design were not uh, on an equal footing. The negotiation was between a power that was leaving and the other side that was asking them to leave. So there was nothing really equal in that equation. And, and when the government delegation was incorporated in those talks, things had already progressed too much and they were seen mainly as an obstacle because they had different ideas and they slowly uh, and soon they realized 
that the Taliban were not even willing to have a discussion because they were saying, we are just talking to Americans. They, they, they treated them as irrelevant, basically. Um, there is another question here, but just I, I'll take the privilege of holding the mic. Uh, <laughs> just for the clarification, uh, can you explain the timeline of the Doha talks uh, in terms of uh, changing US administration and, and what was achieved by the end of Trump's administration? What did Biden's administration mm -hmm. um, got, you know, when, when they entered? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, when the Doha talks started, it was uh, in during the Trump's administration. And then it uh, progressed uh, uh, until there was an agreement. The agreement between the Taliban and United States was signed on February 29th of 2020. Uh, that's when they signed the agreement. So the negotiation was over. Then um, at the, in the beginning of 2021, when the administration changed, they were, they were they, it was already, they were looking in the implementation of the agreement. Mind you, I, it's worth mentioning that agreement had two parts. There was one part that remained secret and was never shared, and the part that was publicly shared. The, the part that was publicly shared had, was vague in terms of many of its conditions and what they needed to achieve, how they wanted to achieve. And the part uh, that was... Um, uh, secret, it remains secret. So the, when the Biden administration took over in January 2021, the agreement was already there. And there was all this back and forth between the Afghan government, the, deleg the, the delegation that were in Doha, uh, between the US representatives of how, how to now materialize the, the agreement. Uh, for several months at the beginning of the administration, we didn't hear much because all we heard was that there is very comprehensive deliberation or happening about how to move forward. In fact, not much until around late March. And it was in April, the, the first thing that we heard was the announcement of the full withdrawal. So this is basically the high level details of how the, the, the timeline for the agreement uh, came to work. Thank you. Uh, could you talk some more about the organization of the Taliban, um, you know, the, the, how it works and its membership and who, uh, are, who identifies with that group within the uh, um, population? Mm -hmm. I will start uh, in the reverse order. Um, there was an annual survey conducted uh, every year by Asia Foundation uh, all around Afghanistan. Uh, that survey uh, was comprehensive and was uh, really reaching uh, 34 provinces of the country. And one of one or several of those questions was always related to support for Taliban, their takeover, their comeback, and whatnot. And uh, usually, that support was very minimal, very minimal. In in certain places more, in certain places less. 5%, 10%, 13%. That, that was basically the range. How the organization work, how they, um, they recruit and whatnot, uh, it's the, I mean, the organization is uh, really uh, extremely hierarchical. 
the different layers of that hierarchy are always submissive to the ultimate decision of supreme leader or whoever sits at the top or the group that sits at the top. And the group that sits at the top somehow insulate or isolate themselves from engaging with anybody outside, in my view, is a strategy. As a, it's their strategy to show that they are impenetrable, that they are divine, that they are incorruptible. And that, what, what works throughout the organization or that bonding or glue that they have is that brainwashing power that injects the ideology, a sense of purpose among the young vulnerable minds. And that indoctrination that they continuously use to, uh, to recruit soldiers, to bring people. Let's think about it. Like, what would really encourage a human being to blow usually himself or herself in maybe cases into pieces among many others? It's, of course, besides hopelessness, that promise or sense of purpose that they have plenty of. It's a promise in heaven. It's commercialization of heaven. And it's something that they will never run out of. So that, in a, in a context that people, children, youth are kept dark, vulnerable, poor, desperate, has worked for them. And that is something that serves as a bonding glue. Now, is there faction, faction, factions among them? Yes. Um, from what we understand and know, they, they of course disagree. They do not uh, necessarily all have the same uh, level of um, radical attitude to certain issues, but the structure is so that it is, it is not a democracy. It's not a system of uh, having a view or opinion. It's a system of allegiance and it is wholesale. This is, this is why a lot of the leverages that the West thought that they had, and especially like they thought, okay, so Doha agreement would give us a way out. And then we have leverage because they want recognition. They want uh, uh, aid for, uh, to, uh, and they, they uh, want humanitarian assistance and whatnot. And, and we will use that to, to, uh, um, to ask them to be more lenient. For example, let women to go to school did not work because their ideology and logic is very different than what the rest of the world understand in terms of governance, politics, and ruling. Um, hi, Sarah Chase, and everyone's gonna hear from me tomorrow. And, and I just wanted to sort of do a two fingers on this question. Um, to say, I, I agree almost entirely with what Roya said, but just a couple of caveats. One is Asia Foundation surveys are notoriously methodologically terrible. So I, I, I'd be a little careful citing those. And, and I know from personal experience, as I watch people, I was hosting the surveyors and they were, you know, filling in the forms in, in the office. Um, also, just to bear in mind that in a place like Afghanistan, surveys, the, the presumption of neutrality doesn't work in that context because um, the Taliban aren't surveying, right? So as soon as you're conducting a survey, survey any respondents know which side you're on and may or may not modify what they're saying in that regard. And, and again, I, I don't want to make the give the impression that I'm saying that the Taliban are wildly popular or that they're a good thing. But and, and my perspective is very much from the southern part of the country, which is one of their heartlands. 
but uh, really there started to be begin, I, I would say it was very minority in around 2005, but increasingly out of frustration and indignation with the way the democratic government was treating them, more and more people were seeing the Taliban as a, um, a protest vote to some extent, um, but a genuine kind of alternative. And so I wouldn't, yes to indoctrination and all of that, but not exclusively desperation, also anger, bruised dignity, um, it's a way of fighting back at government officials who have treated you really horrifically. And just to say that I took a look at another half a dozen countries that had ideological insurgencies in them, and this work I did in, you know, around 2015 like that, but Uzbekistan, uh, Arab Spring countries, Nigeria, Boko Haram, and very, very similar patterns of a turn toward militant, violent, puritanical religion in a context, context of indignation against government corruption. Um, so just to sort of make a bit of a conversation um, and a slightly different perspective on that. Do a race. We're catching up with your workout. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, engaging talk. And the, the main thing I took from it is uh, your warning uh, not to isolate Afghanistan at this moment. Um, and uh, you mentioned, for example, encouraging uh, students exchange. And I wonder. Uh, to what extent it is possible, it is feasible. If our goal is to undermine the grip of the Taliban, the, the minds of people, why should they cooperate with that? Uh, what paths do we have to uh, expose uh, Afghanistan to the world uh, in, in a way that will be meaningful? Um, so uh, yeah. if, if you could be more specific about it. Yeah, um, this, is, this is why I mentioned that we probably cannot get anywhere repeating the same strategies and approaches that we have already tried. Uh, a person who was named the genius called it insanity. Uh, so uh, um, what we need to do is, first of all, this idea that if we support people, like the, 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 the two main parts of the current debate, some on one side, some on the other, to say completely disengage because they are intolerable and it has to be demonstrated. And that, that's the right uh, or principled or moral ground that we need to take. And the, and the one that they say, yes, but if we do that, they will, people will suffer. Um, in that regard, first of all to think that anything that you do right now in afghanistan in a way that the taliban are not benefiting including the 40 million cash that is delivered uh, for the expenses every week uh, i think it is a little bit self-deceiving they are ruling and of course that's that's the hard reality that we are faced in now to to help people is absolutely crucial because the hungrier the people are the more vulnerable they are the more susceptible to recruitment they are i agree with Sarah's point of view that yes, there were grievances uh, that served as a way for people to uh, support uh, Taliban. They were also forced in many, many families around the country, including in the South. So many people had one son in the uh, Afghan army, another son 
working for the Taliban. The same was in the Eastern provinces because they had no choice. They had to give in to both sides for their own protection and survival. And there was the grievances, the, the lack of justice system. Taliban had a very different way of delivering justice. They would get together and they will rule and justice would be served that, on that moment, depending on who made that decision. So there, there were a lot of these, these factors, but now vulnerability means people will be even more or uh, uh, more susceptible to indoctrination. Uh, based on some of the reports I have seen, there is a lot of people who are joining ISIS because they don't have a choice. Criminal activities has increased in so much because people have nothing to eat. So how to engage? Um, we really need newer approaches, out of the box thinking, and maybe setting aside this, looking at this real crisis as an intellectual debate, because it's not. It's a real crisis, and it will have overspill effects, and it will deepen the situation in Afghanistan. So all forms of support, strategies, approaches that would be helpful. Practical example, the aid organization has to be supported to do more. Right now, um, while women are banned from working at any sector, they are still allowed to, to work in health. That is an avenue. They could be participating more and more. Uh, there could be more support in the aid packets that are delivered specifically for young girls in order to bring up their values. Those are the ones that get sold first. The way to counter that is to bring up their value in the family, that they don't be looked at as one of their commodities for sale. There is a potential for connecting them with maybe battery sufficient, uh, battery efficient uh, tablets uh, to, um, to study. I'm not saying it's easy. And definitely you need to work with some uh, people at the local level, including the Taliban. And this is those who have succeeded have done that. So there are ways to help, to get help to the people, but it definitely needs a bit of uh, thinking and re-strategizing and shoring things up. So <clears throat> this question might sound almost like a provocation, but it's really not. Uh, and I, I can't think of anyone with more expertise on this to sort of help me think about it. But um, the ways in which aid and assistance and support for women came into Afghanistan after the Taliban fell the first mm -hmm. time did lead to other kinds of blowback. Mm -hmm. where there was a perception mm -hmm. that women were getting special treatment and mm -hmm. why so much. And I had a, mm -hmm. a student here uh, years ago who I was very fond of. Mm -hmm. He was very, you know, great student. But I remember him saying, you know, all of this aid comes in and it's for women and it's mm -hmm. having problems and it's not helping in mm -hmm. ways that it wants to. Um, and now we are facing what seems like an almost uh, far worse situation mm -hmm. for women in mm -hmm. the country. So my question is, how do you implement aid packages earmarked for women without somehow elevating misogyny? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. In fact, I, I want to add to what you just said, is that from the people who are working on the ground uh, uh, and I talk to them, 
I hear that some of the Taliban at the local level has told them that they have to remove women from work because there is such scarcity of employment and work anyways. And if they are, they are men, the one that fought for them, the one that have been part of the organizations don't have jobs. And of course, in their ideology, if there is a job, first it, is, it has to go naturally to a man of the family because that determines his role and value and everything. Why, why should it go to women? So they, they do think uh, even more at, at that level. And you were talking about like the backlash among, among people and it's very real. I have heard it, I have seen it. Uh, so the, while this was very true, uh, and I think what I am saying is my view and you know, is that many may not agree, but I believe that it was worth it. It was worth it because it actually ignited a shift in the mindset that was never historically experienced. The, the, the shift in the mindset happened in so many levels that now looking at what's happening looks like nothing worked, but it did work. And, and I believe that one of the best outcome of the intervention was how women were empowered, how women got education and how that really helped shape and change the dynamic of this, this society at different levels. So yes, it did, it did have backlash, but the same happened in so many other ways. The, the, the fact that, you know, like the, the, the troops were there, that the foreigners were there, that the media was free. I mean, there was backlash on so many other things as well. So in my view, I think that was a worthwhile effort. But now by incorporating special sorts of treatment for women, how, how to uh, help the situation, I think, Again, looking at the situation, who, who have been the people in Afghanistan who have really put their lives in the line and have protested? Women. Who are the ones who probably will be catering and caring more about the well-being of the communities? And they are also usually shouldered out when the aid is getting distributed, especially given that women workers are not even allowed. So by incorporating that incentive, what I suggest is to maybe help promote the value of girl child in particular within the family. That because that economic incentive helped a lot before. Maybe it will be helpful again. And then through that, hopefully we will, we will be able to explore additional avenues of helping and support. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Mohammed Rahman. Uh, thank you for uh, an interesting talk. Uh, uh, indeed, it was very important to tell people like what's happened and what's happening and what will happen. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming on my question, like what will be the future uh, consequences of U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in terms of uh, uh, political, uh, yeah. like the consequences, the future consequences of U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh the question is that what are the consequences of uh, military withdrawal from Afghanistan politically for, for who? For US. Are you asking about the political consequences for who? Uh, that that's a little too difficult <laughs> to answer because I think I think in globally there is not necessarily 
I, I, I can't seem to package and say that this would be a consequence necessarily globally, because there is different arguments depending which side you are asking. There are sides that are arguing <clears throat> that it, for example, encouraged Russia to invade Ukraine. There are sides who are arguing that, that it may encourage China to invade Taiwan. Uh, there is sites that say there was no other way out. You could have extended another six months, another year. The same story was going on. There wasn't a lot of a huge number of troops left at the time that the withdrawal happened. There was 2,500 US troops with the NATO troops total amount of them would add up somewhere around 10,000. There were 7,500 uh, NATO troops uh, combined and then 2,500 US troops. There is about 200, um, sorry, 2,000 US troops somewhere in Egypt that everybody had forgotten about. So that uh, it, it, it really depends uh, um, who you are talking about and what perspective you would really cut out, and I wouldn't uh, be qualified to talk about the political consequences for a particular country, let alone globally. Uh, you know, the factor that you haven't mentioned, and I think it follows up on this, and also I think it, it uh, supports the, the side that you're taking that we should not cut off all support and all connection to Afghanistan uh, on the argument that, oh, that would just encourage the Taliban or help them. I think the China factor is something that, that I'd like to ask you about. Mm -hmm. I just saw, uh, and I talked to a, a, um, a, a Chinese documentary filmmaker right. who produced this film that uh, appeared on Al Jazeera, The Coming Gold Rush in Afghanistan, and I saw his one-hour film, and there's a lot of Chinese business people that are in there doing stuff mm. right now. Mm. I saw a guy standing in a wasteland, maybe 20 miles north of Kabul. There's nothing there, just you know, shrubbery and, and, and mm. dry hills. Mm. And he said, yeah, we're building a city here and we're gonna have uh, 3 million people here in, uh, you know, within three yeah. years. Somebody else was building a road in order to produce a, um, a marble mine. And the Taliban were you know, shaking hands with them and signing contracts and very happy to do business with them. And the Chinese, uh, as far as I could tell, and it seems like it's it's their way, they're not concerned mm -hmm. about human rights and women's this and that. Mm -hmm. They're just, you know, we're a business and you you do what you want. Sure. Uh, and they were building five-star hotels mm -hmm. in Kabul and mm -hmm. there were individual business people setting up to do Airbnb for Chinese middle class. So, you know, it's not just, oh, we'll leave the international community. There's another international community over to the east that's interested in, in getting into Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and then that's going to really have consequences for the balance of power globally, I think. Mm -hmm. See, you have the right person to talk to. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean it because, because Professor Ansari is very well qualified given, given his engagement in Central Asia, given his long-standing work that he has done uh, uh, all around. It, it would be a perfect discussion and I would love to learn from. Uh, but just to react to what you say, uh, exactly, I, I agree with you. This, this is a, a very potent concern. I did mention in my remarks that there are people that the Taliban could be doing business with who do not ask them for compromises. I did not name them. <laughs> and there is more than one. Uh, to add to your point, uh, Chinese were the very first people who moved uh, or who made a move vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan's mines. They put a cap on the copper mine. You, you know the whole story. You have elaborately talked in your book about it, that how they, they, they came in, they offered a kind of rate and royalty that nobody could match. 
they got the contract, people did not read the fine prints. Um, they just put a cap on it. Nobody can really do any work around the site. They own it. Things fall apart. They came back. They didn't deliver. They didn't do anything that they said. And then, uh, but they did what they wanted. They put a cap on it. Now, I don't know on how many more mines this is happening and how many things are already being mined. Afghanistan is very rich with rare earth. We have great sources of lithium which is very essential for the fight against climate change. Uh, I was in a close discussion with some Chinese experts once, and they said, well, we are not interested because we think if there was anything good in Afghanistan, the Americans should have already taken it. If they didn't take it, it means it wasn't worthwhile. And the other thing they, they, they said was, uh, why should we go look for lithium in Afghanistan. China has lithium reserves, quite significant amount of them, as we know. And then maybe we will go to Chile instead of Afghanistan, where they have roads. So, but that doesn't mean that they don't do it. And you already alluded to it. It's their way. Before you know, they own you. Um, my question was going to be related to this as well, um, because um, Afghanistan Professor, I'm sorry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because um, Afghanistan is in a very vulnerable place and is in a place where um, it could be uh, exploited a lot. Yes. Um, with these rare earth materials and and with the city that uh, he mentioned, I think they wanted it to be only for Chinese people to not have the local laws mm -hmm. to have their own laws and mm -hmm. all of these these luxury hotels they're not beneficial to the average Afghan person so what like what local industries can be supported there or what what like uh, local industries can lead to better literacy and uh, uh, wealth that stays within Afghanistan and it's not just like people are being exploited for very cheap and and um, nobody's benefiting. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think we are in good company here because as the name suggests, it is perspectives about Afghanistan, but also probably we can seek ways forward. These are very important points that you are raising. I think these should be the reasons, as it was alluded here before, uh, um, by the question that was asked uh, in the in the second row and what Professor Ansari was saying, uh, and that is, uh, it should be enough reasons for uh, Western allies, international community, to to think about. This is, uh, this is one side of the story. The other side of the story that I don't want to get into is, oh, if, if this entire region sort of becomes unstable, uh, there is another concern that China has, and it's also very relevant from all my engagements with them as an official over the years. I never ceased to see that how China is scared, really spooked about the growth of extremism and its penetration through the Xinjiang community to their borders. I never saw any neighbor of Afghanistan, China included, to have a stronger economic view towards Afghanistan versus that of security and political. Security and political is the first lens that they look at the country, in China included. So they have been always very, very conscious and concerned about that. In fact, you may recall, or some of you may have followed, that one of the very few people who visited the uh, when Taliban took over after a couple of months ago was Foreign Minister Wang. 
uh, of China who went to Kabul. A lot of people interpreted that as eyeing the natural resources, uh, agreeing on economic cooperation. But from what I understand, I know he was primarily concerned and the main topic of, visit, of his visit was containing the, the threat of extremism. So, um, yes, there should be ways to, to look at that. I think here in US, this is a very good argument. Uh, it, it should be definitely discussed. Um, how you could support the local communities to resist that. Um, I believe that one of the best ways to break out of this cycle would be uh, support, uh, economic support for projects. Different um, players should go in and support that. That would be probably the way out of this vicious cycle of continuously treating Afghanistan as a backyard for all the regional and global players. We have, all right. So we have time for one more question and then we can keep it going in the reception. Uh, my question is very short. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, in your opinion, uh, what is the best way to get rid of the Taliban? An easy one too, right? <laughs> I think we, we, we did it, we, we, we weren't able to do it in 20 years. Um, um, what, is, what is the best way to get rid of Taliban? Because we don't have much time. I will tell you my, my shortest answer. The best way to get rid of Taliban is to help Afghanistan build a functional economy. Educate people, build a functional economy. That's the way out. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I, will, I don't have a question, just a couple of comments and make sure to make it short. Uh, apart from those two main approaches that you highlighted, one which suggests that will isolate Afghanistan and the other that you suggest mm -hmm. su sustain the mm -hmm. humanitarian aid, I will say there is a third one also. Uh, the third one are the ones who are saying, well, isolate the Taliban, not Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Support the women of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but also support and enable everyone who is standing against the Taliban. Mm -hmm. This may include civil, but mm -hmm. also may include other ways of resistance. Mm -hmm. Experiences from Iran, which is the same autocratic the theocratic mm -hmm. regime, shows that to isolate also doesn't work, mm -hmm. and to also support that regime also doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It only increases the suffering of the people. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the political elite of Afghanistan are divided amongst the two groups. The ones who were the President Ghani's corrupt team, some of, some of them remained and called for engagement with the Taliban. Zakhilwal, the ex-minister of finance, Amar Khil, who was the chief of corrupt election commission, they are the ones who are there and just, just lobbying for support mm -hmm. of the Taliban, mm -hmm. sustain the regime. They don't call for support to the people and the women. Mm. They're, they're calling for sustaining the regime. No one is there to voice that there's a gender apartheid going on in the country. How do you address gender apartheid? No other regime in the world is gender apartheid except Afghanistan. That is severe. International law enables us to address that one. How can we mobilize international community of lawyers, human rights defenders, women rights defenders, to put pressure legally and hold the Taliban leaders accountable. That also leads me to the last point to say, the uprising of Taliban was not just grievances against corruption. A big elephant in the room was ideology. And that's not just Islamism. Exactly. That also includes ethno-Afghan nationalism, which sustained this regime. This regime does not exclude just women. The regime excludes all non-Pashtuns. How many non-Pashtuns do you have in the high-ranking positions? They dismantled all participation of non-Pashtuns. It's, it, of course, it, it may not elevate to the situation of an ethnic apartheid, but for sure that is subjugation and segregation of ethnicities in Afghanistan. No one talks about that one. And that's really unfortunate of people of Afghanistan. 
To sustain this regime, that means sustaining an apartheid regime. How did we end apartheid regime in Africa? Not with engaging with the regime, isolating them. But it doesn't mean isolate the people. Enable the poor women in Afghanistan to resist. Enable the civilians to stand up against the regime. I do not call for another global intervention, military intervention, enough of it. That's not a solution. But of course, a solution is to empower people to, to say no to the regime. Thank you. Uh, this is Hadat Nurzai, uh, correspondent from Christian Science Monitor. As I wrote my last story about uh, girls, uh, girls' schools, if the international community did not succeed to first Taliban to open girls' school, what will be the next option? Uh, I am not so sure if the international community can really force Taliban to open the girls' school with the approaches that have been applied so far, like cutting aid, sanctioning, banning this, banning that, because we have already seen that it does not incur any response or desirable response. There, the pressure should be um, in, asserted in different ways. There are ways. It, there is different ways to pressure on Taliban that hasn't really been applied so far. And also, we do not uh, have the time to wait until they feel mercy and open the doors for the girls. I think every opportunity should be explored to get resources, material, online class, whatever it takes. By no means, I think it's acceptable to, to say now all the girls of Afghanistan should, should go and do everything online. But I have been there personally, and I have experienced firsthand what it means not to be able to go to school. Any source of material, resources, opportunities will save the day. And this is, I think, what we need to focus on for today. But this is not it, right? You need to really look at those possible measures to bring the right kind of pressures. Thank you. I have a paper out. There is some of that in it. Thank <laughs> you.